Professor Yang, you have been engaged in urban planning for more than 50 years. In the preface to the book Cities for People, you mentioned that until 1960, cities around the world were developed primarily on the basis of the century-old traditions. Could you please elaborate on this and share your viewpoint on the most prominent centuries-old tradition of city making? Throughout the history of mankind, actually, uh, the main thing in cities had always been the spaces, the places, the streets, the squares, the parks where people could meet and where life could unfold. But with the modernism, all the old things was discarded. The architects and planners said that everything old cannot be used. We have to make everything completely new. We have to start, think about a completely new way of settlement. And now we shall not make cities. Actually, cities are very bad. We shall make not spaces for life, but single buildings. So the whole focus went from the spaces which forms a building to the monuments, the objects, the buildings. If you think of an old city, you can recall and remember all the streets and squares, but you cannot remember any buildings, only the town hall and the uh, cathedral. If you think of the new cities like Dubai, you can remember, oh, there was this tower and that tower and that tower. Were there any spaces in Dubai? No, you cannot remember them. They were unimportant. So this was the most dramatic change in the history of human settlements. That was this shift from making cities of spaces to making single buildings. That also, of course, was the starting point for the architects to really say, start to compete on who could make the most funny buildings and the most strange buildings. And that was the, also the reason why we could have the star architects who all of them could do all these funny buildings all over the world. Because now the buildings were more important than the spaces. And uh, this modernism started in the 30s, actually in the 20s, in the 30s it started, but only after 1960 did it become really widespread. And that was the basis for the majority of all the housing in the former Soviet Union and all the socialistic states, they built uh, concrete blocks, building by building by building. They didn't build cities, they built buildings. And uh, only in the last 20 years after 2000, have we managed to stop this movement and say that the major thing in cities is a meeting of people it's not the agglomeration of buildings. We don't do it to make the cars happy or the architects happy. We must do the cities to make people happy. Yeah, it's really interesting because you did so much huge work for this. It's, it, it's really appreciated for this because you change a lot of things in this way. So today, uh, cities are becoming more oriented towards people, how you now said about it. Could you please describe what a comfortable, vibrant and safe city should look like on your viewpoint? Oh, it's very simple. Um, I would always refer to Venice. What is characteristic about Venice? That is a city with no cars. There could never were there were never room for cars. The dimensions were so small, and there were all the bridges with stairs. Cars could never enter Venice. So Venice was built as a city for people, and still is a city for people. And the transportation is organized by water buses, vaporettos going around. And the principle in Venice is that the transition from slow to fast traffic is not by your bedside, but at the edge of the city. So the first part of your journey is slow and in the city and part of the city, and then you can mount a fast media and go somewhere else. 
I still think that Venice is a very, very interesting. I'm not talking about Venice as a tourist destination. It's only because Venice is so fantastic and so beautiful that everybody streamed there and actually destroy what was nice. But if you go to the parts of Venice where the tourists do not come, it's a lovely place. And it's so peaceful. The noise level is low. You can talk to each other on the street. You can hear people. There are no playgrounds because they never needed playgrounds. The city was so interesting that the city is a playground. It's a classroom. And uh, I always think that a good city for the future would be like Venice, but with no bridges so that the bicycles can also go around. And the handicapped people and the old people will not have to climb up and down the stairs. And underneath this fantastic new town should be a very efficient, wonderful subway system which will link you to other Venices, other cities for people like pearls on a string. Oh, thank you so much. Can you speak a little bit more about Venice? Because you are a really great architecture. So on your opinion, maybe you did research of the city. Uh, how do you think? Which technology they used to build the city? Or maybe why the city looks like really different from um, in other cities and still nobody cannot repeat the city as like Venice, like example for now. Venice is a very it's a strange example. It's an, a very old city which has not been destroyed. Uh, it has survived. So, and it has not been destroyed by the traffic. All our cities were like Venice way back, but they were destroyed by fire or by war or by automobiles or by modern planning. Uh, but Venice has just been left alone and has been handed over. So we can see in Venice how it was in those days. And um, also when Venice was built, it was the biggest city in the world and it was the most rich city in the world. So they had lots of money to do just the fantastic right thing for people which they did. And that's why it's so beautiful. That's also why the, the, it's all human scale because it's meant to walk around and the spaces are very beautiful and the vistas and everything is fantastic. Um, and it's been left over because cars could not penetrate. So that's a, a wonderful story actually. Also in history, Many suffered a number of setbacks. The Turks or the Ottoman Empire cut off the trade routes to the east, which was where Venice was trading, so they couldn't go there. At the same time, the Spaniards and the Portuguese found America, and so everybody was trading with America, and nobody was interested in the, in the east, uh, where the Ottoman had closed it anyway. So economically, Venice died and that was very fortunate because that is why it was preserved. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Jan, in the book Cities for People, Richard Roger said that cities can be read like books and Jan Gale understand their language. Figuratively speaking, could you please tell about the alphabet of this language, of the cities? Mm -hmm. There is a, a, a saying that first you form the cities, then they form you. It is a fantastic difference to your life and your lifestyle, depending on where you live, even in the same country. If you live in a, in a, in a spread out single family house area, if you live on the 19th floor in a high rise, or if you live in a dense, low housing, row house area with very nice small streets, whatever. You can have completely different lifestyles and how much you walk and how much you bicycle and how much you use your car is very much a product of where you live. In some places you cannot live without having a car 
because for many years we made places where you can only live if you have a car. But in the old cities, they were never built for cars. So there you can still walk a lot. And the doctors now, they say that one of the major problems of mankind, that is sitting too much. They call it the sitting syndrome and say that we as architects and planners shall do everything we can to make places where people work and live so that they walk and bicycle as much as possible during their normal days because we need to use our muscles and our uh, own energy instead of use fossil fuel energy. And also if we do it, we live much longer and have a much a much better life and it's good for climate, it's good for health, it's good for you. What are we waiting for? All this about building exclusively for people who have a car. That is, to me, that is history. That is old fashioned. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Jan, maybe you have a classification of cities because all around the world, cities are different. You work all around the world, like New York, London, Moscow also. Do you have some classification of cities? No. No? <laughs> no, but I would like to say that in all places, in all cities, in all countries, there is a history, there is a development of history. There was, um, maybe there was a time before the First World War, the time between the, the wars, the time after the Second War, and then the, the, the most recent 20, 20, 30 years. And we've seen a number of different ideologies and ways of building, which actually are rather international. So in the socialistic times, you had all these concrete housing, but they built concrete housing blocks all over the world based on the modernistic ideology. Now, many places are more into a more humanistic ideology. And so in each, each country, you can see these various faces. But then, of course, there are differences based on culture, based on uh, climate, based on topography, and also based on, on um, the conditions in the nation. Um, I would normally say that the small nations, they can do much better than the big nations because it's easier to change the way you think in a small country than in a big country. But also there has been influences by universities and by individuals, Jane Jacobs, whatever, in various countries, which can be the reason why today all of us are are looking at a city like Melbourne, which, which have done very well, Copenhagen has done very well. There's a number of cities where they have they've done very well and other cities believe that they are sort of in the forefront in, in making a better climate policy, in making better quality of life situations. And that can also be ex explained by some national differences and some specific uh, combinations of a, a good president or good mayor or a good team of scientists who could influence here and there and there. So we, we have these lists of most livable cities in the world and you can see it's the same cities who pop up on all the lists and all the time because they started and now, like Copenhagen, they feel obliged to be up front. So they have to do more and more. That's good. It's good for the citizens to have a very ambitious city government. Thank you so much. And we now came to the last question. So what happens to psychology and philosophy of a person who travel to different cities or countries, let's say, every month because of the war? How do you think? Yeah, um, I don't think I can answer that one because um, um, I know that with, with globalization and whatever, there is a possibility to
to commute a lot and you can now commute to America or to, to Ukraine or you can do long distances. And I guess that if you are too much here and there and here and there, you get a little bit dizzy and you get uprooted and you don't know really where you belong. Um, I myself, in my work with cities and with studying cities and the life of Homo sapiens in his urban settings, I have been traveling quite much throughout my life on time, on, uh, but not in the last four months. That's the first time I've been forced to stay home for four months. But anyway, and that has not been regularly, that's been to go and see some and come back. And I always have had a very firm base here in Copenhagen. And we also know that our research has influenced the city of Copenhagen very much through a long period. It started in the 60s and we have had a lot of influence. And many say that this is one of the reasons why Copenhagen have done so many nice things because they had a chance to change their mindset because research was done in how the city worked and people were saying, this doesn't work, this do work, do that, do that. And that has worked in Copenhagen rather nicely. So I'm very happy that I have my base here because it's a very nice city. Thank you so much. May I ask one extra question? Because You are welcome. Thank you so much. Because you travel a lot and you really saw a lot of big cities, not only big, but the general one. Do you have the favorite cities and why they are favorite for you? I have already mentioned that. Yeah. I have been a consultant to Copenhagen and I like that city. I've also been consultant to Melbourne and they have done a lot of, of good things in Melbourne. I have been consultant to a number of other cities like New York, where I was part of transforming Times Square from a traffic circus onto a people place. Um, so I've seen these changes happening. And if I should say what I like, I've already said it. For modern cities, it would be Melbourne and Copenhagen. And for old cities, it would be Melbourne. Oh, sorry, Venice, Venice, sorry, Venice. Venice. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it's a really beautiful place, true. So thank you so much, Professor Young. I really, really appreciate it. Maybe I should also say what I hate. What? That I really hate Dubai. Yeah, <laughs> why? I think that it's not a city, it's a collection of towers, and it's got no soul, mm -hmm. and... Uh, you cannot be there with your body. You cannot walk, hardly walk and move around. You have to be in car all the time. Everything has to be air conditioned and, and all the water has to be boiled from the sea. Um, that's not a way for me. Yeah, it's like how you said in one of the books, like city as a machine maybe, yeah? Something feels like this. Yeah, and also uh, full of... Um, full of stack tech work, uh, funny towers. It looks like perfume bottles mm -hmm. uh, when you go down their main street, uh, in my opinion. Um, I, 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 I would not go there uh, voluntarily, uh, but I've seen it a number of times and I know enough. I, I can go other places I like more. Yeah.